What's up, everyone? Today, I'm really excited to share an interview uh, with my buddy, Chris Hansford, who is uh, the founder of Digital Fairness. And Digital Fairness is all about kind of consumer protection in the digital space. And uh, I'll let Chris kind of share more about the work that they're doing. But from my perspective, there's been a lot of uh, action recently on the legislative side of really being able to kind of bring more consumer protections to digital goods and, and video games and things like that. And there's been a number of, of actual, you know, big kind of announcements that happened you know, in the last week. So I want to kind of bring Chris on uh, for him to kind of share a bit about what he's seeing on that front. Because, you know, as uh, we know, you know, people who struggle with video game addiction, you know, there's one perspective of it, which is being able to kind of support ourselves and, and support our own recovery. And at the same time, I'm a big believer in being an advocate for other addicts out there to be able to help, you know, the game industry make, you know, some changes that, that help bring, you know, video games and, and just keep them fun and keep them fair instead of having them kind of go down a more manipulative path that, you know, has kind of caused some addiction issues in the first place. So, all right, Chris, welcome. Thanks very much, Cam. I appreciate you uh, having me on as part of the conversation. So just give us a bit of context quickly. Um, you know, how did you get involved in, in the work that you're doing now? And, and I know we connected, you know, a few months ago, but, you know, what kind of inspired you initially to kind of get involved in, in this industry? So Consumers for Digital Fairness is the first nonprofit uh, consumer protection organization um, in the United States focused on uh, video games and the gaming community. Um, I put it together with a couple of good friends of mine. We're all based in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, and we all work, uh, we all do political work in one way or another. Uh, some folks specialize in communications and research. Uh, I specialize in politics and policy. Um, and regardless of our uh, personal political orientations, we all kind of have united, especially in our free time, around the industry, around the topics, um, and enjoy gaming sometimes as part of our pastime outside of the office and outside of the kind of stressful political environment uh, that your your work can take you in. It's an area that we kind of, over the past uh, six to eight months had seen a lot of talk about, uh, really always been following a lot of community leaders like yourself and talking about addiction issues and, and issues of consumer protection. Uh, and together we decided we wanted to step up, put an organization together uh, and help give a unifying voice to people's concerns around uh, gaming addiction, around uh, consumer protections and around uh, loot boxes and the way that companies should be treating their consumers fairly. And we felt that that just wasn't happening in the video game space. Yeah, it's, you know, interesting for me as someone who's been involved, you know, on the front lines of this issue since 2011, because it feels like to me that over the last year, things on the consumer protection side have accelerated very quickly. And, you know, for so long, the game industry was adamant that, you know, gaming was not a problem. There were no problems with their games. And now that seems to have shifted a little bit. And, you know, the big announcement last week by the ESA around bringing kind of warning labels to their games around uh, in-app purchases, for, for lack of a better term, uh, mm. seems to be like a pretty significant, you know, move on, on their part to, to actually, you know, recognize that, that there may be uh, some, I don't know if you could call it danger, but, but there are some protections that are necessary. And, you know, I, I think there's a couple of things we can talk about on this, but, but do you feel like things have really accelerated over the last year? Absolutely. Um, just in terms of, as a cold hard fact, uh, the video gaming industry is the largest virtually unregulated uh, industry in the world. Uh, it represents uh, tens of billions of dollars in global revenue, and especially in the United States as one of the, uh, virtually its largest market, um, or one of its largest markets, there's almost no real consumer protections or oversight, either uh, when you're discussing uh, content or uh, systems uh, designed to encourage, be they positively or negatively, uh, ongoing and recurring play. But that really is lit off. You can, uh, people on the, on the psychology side can discuss the pros and cons there. But as I was trying to allude to, it's really lit off within the last six months uh, over loot boxes and certain industry bad actors, I think just kind of going above and beyond, uh, and to use an old phrase, jumping the shark when it comes to the way they want to use uh, psychological tricks and ploys to not only keep people engaged and playing their game, but also use that as a monetization mechanism 
to extract more cash from folks, to get folks to spend more, uh, and to boost their revenue numbers as opposed to just the old model of building content, selling that content, going back and building more content. Yeah, and yeah. It's, that's one of the interesting parts to me is, is that, you know, I remember last, I, th- I believe it was last year, I was speaking a lot at gambling prevention, kind of problem gambling, which is gambling addiction conferences. And the whole skin betting phenomena was a big topic of conversation where mm-hmm. you had, you know, in Cash Strike Global Offensive, you were able to bet in some kind of way and, and be able to, to win a skin for, for your game. And then that didn't have any, any actual you know, monetary value, but it did on third-party websites. And so exactly. you had people, you know, I remember distinctly, I had a, a comment on YouTube from a 13-year-old who said, you know, Cam, I just placed my first bet and I did it because all, the, all my friends at school are doing it and I'm scared I'm going to do it again. And I remember distinctly that it was unregulated because virtual goods are unregulated and so they were kind of saying like, look, you know, this is not our problem. And then because of the pushback that, that Valve received, they came out, I remember it was in July or, or, or some, sometime around there where they said, we're actually going to cut off access to all of these third-party sites. And I thought that was a pretty significant moment. And I was honestly pretty surprised that the game industry actually did that right? because up until that point, they had just been in complete denial saying, you know, our games are not a problem. And, you know, I guess that was the beginning. And it seems like on the loot box side, on the microtransaction side, we've been able to, to make way and, and be able to, to be able to actually bring some, you know, even threat of legislation, or some momentum along that path. But for so long, the conversation around regulation had to do with violence in video games. Exactly. In, and that's, which, that's a censorship discussion that I really think should not be even part of the public dialogue. That was hashed out in the 90s. Mm-hmm. There are innumerable studies that I'm sure you've seen um, that show that there is absolutely no link whatsoever between violence or content in games and violent behavior in children. Um, and, and that's to, to always be, I want to be clear about our mission and about uh, the folks that are seeking protections in the community. This is not a discussion about censorship. Um, we're not looking to say, oh, we need to protect people from content that, that, that may be questionable to your morals or ethics, that it's an art form that should not be moderated. It's when uh, folks are using specific business practices that we're deeply concerned about. But you're very right. They're, this is kind of the newest iteration of an ongoing discussion uh, that originally started in the 90s, was not very productive, was very dangerous to the industry and very dangerous to the art form. And now uh, I think we kind of have switched gears a little bit to where um, certain companies are uh, engaging in some pretty dangerous and pretty questionable practices. Yeah, and you know, I, I as I was sharing about some of these kind of legislative efforts last week, we received a comment on on Reddit in the Stop Gaming community, uh, and one of the gentlemen shared that you know the ESA was one of the single biggest lobbying organizations, especially federally in in the U.S. Yep. And uh, you know, he was sharing that they have a budget of like six point seven million dollars a year. Uh, you know, for lobbying efforts. And mm-hmm. he was kind of skeptical that, you know, it, it's, he kind of shared that it seems unlikely that more significant changes which present a threat to larger publishers would occur beyond some of these just, you know, uh, initial kind of entry level legislative efforts. And, and so what do you kind of say to that? Like, is, are some of these just small wins that, that we're getting that build momentum to bigger wins or, or are these you know, kind of like some of the low hanging fruit that we're going to be able to get, but moving beyond that is, is not really going to happen. So the political, uh, not, I'm not a lobbyist uh, per se, but the uh, lobbying industry, the government relations industry is my industry and one I know quite well. Um, and while the ESA has been very successful so far uh, in keeping regulation out of the industry, um, that budget is, is not one of the more substantial ones that I've seen. There are companies and or and trade organizations out there uh, whose budgets absolutely dwarf that. Um, and if you're just looking at a dollar figure, yeah, um, that can seem uh, kind of dangerous. Mm-hmm. But when you think about it, we're a nonprofit startup organization. Um, we've raised under $10,000 and we are already seeing and finding legislators to work with in over a dozen states. They're interested in this topic. 
people on its just its merits alone understand this issue and understand, regardless of whether they're Democrats or Republicans, that hey, this is a concerning problem. Yeah, these loot boxes to me look pretty much like gambling or are gambling. Uh, we shouldn't be selling this to kids or we shouldn't be selling it in an unregulated way. That's concerning. How can we help? Let's get involved. So to say that we've had a couple of wins is true. I'm excited about the progress we've made, um, but it's definitely, it's not the end and it's definitely not, uh, I think, a high water mark by any stretch of the imagination. It's, it's the newest kind of chapter in the fight. And as we move forward, we've already seen that there are thought leaders on this issue, uh, Democrats and Republicans, that are not giving up, they're not going away, um, and that the, the community around this is growing and people are getting more engaged in understanding that this is a, a major concern. And that when you lay out for them very simply, a loot box is combining the three core elements, especially for the US legal definition of gambling, of uh, consideration, odds, and prize. So the consideration or the bet is the purchase of the loot box, the odds, obviously, there are odds inside of the loot box that make certain things more rare, certain things more common. And then the prize is whatever pops out the other end uh, when you open your loot box. Those are the three re legal requirements for gambling. You explain that to a legislator, you talk to them, and regardless of generation, once you get that education piece accomplished, nine times out of ten, they're, they're keying in and saying, that I'm sorry, what? That, that's currently going on? That's not a, a thing they're considering? And it's like, no, that's going on actively. It's a multi-billion dollar uh, revenue generator for bad actors, and this is going on right now in your district. How can, how, how, or, or will you help us? And almost man and woman, they'll say, yes, Let's get on board. Let's start talking about it. Let me talk to some other legislators. Let's get going. So I really do not think that this is, um, by any stretch of the imagination, a high water point. And we're not really uh, worried about the uh, financial means of uh, any specific other lobbying organization. Uh, when you have an issue that's really this clear cut, it's pretty nice that legislators, even in this day and age, will look at it, regardless of political stripe, and say, on the merits alone, let's find a solution. And this isn't just happening in the U.S. For, for people listening. This also is happening internationally. Last week, there was also uh, a story that came out that, you know, in the Netherlands, they have now, you know, given, uh, well, Chris, why don't you tell us what happened in the Netherlands? Sure. So um, the Netherlands, and I'm, I'm not as familiar with the European uh, political system, so I, I won't get into kind of the ins and outs there, but uh, the specific regulatory body within the Netherlands that looks at uh, games and gaming had examined, uh, they've yet to release the titles of the products that they looked at, um, but they looked at uh, several different games that offer loot boxes, uh, and they determined based off of their laws that at least four of the largest, they, they defined them as the largest games being played. So that could be by player base. Uh, we can probably, I guess, guess at those titles. It's probably not hard to figure out. Um, but they said that at least four of the games that they looked at, which were major international active player releases, uh, do fit the legal definition of gambling for uh, the Netherlands and their jurisdiction, that they would be pursuing additional action along those lines. Now, the key, def uh, the key uh, description within that was that they were games that allowed or had allowed four mechanisms to be put in place where you could sell or directly monetize the prizes outside of or within the confines of the game. So that is a kind of specific definition um, that might not be applicable to all games and is one that we are not um, perfectly on board with, but we really think that this is a great first step um, and is a really great lead in the European and American markets for a regulator to understand, yes, we need to be in the 21st century with our definitions and our regulations. And it's, it's fantastic that a national regulator that is coming from not just an opinion perspective and a, a well-informed perspective like you are in mine, but a well-researched and, and highly institutionalized legal perspective is saying, yes, this is gambling, this is unregulated, and it will stop. So we're pretty excited about that. Wonderful. And, you know, as we kind of begin to wrap up, I'm curious, like, from a, can you give us a preview of, you know, we've got some small wins now and, and that's built some momentum where does it go from here? Like ultimately, you know, for, for some gamers listening to this, they're, they're going to be a little bit concerned about, you know, regulation and gaming. And, you know, we've kind of already addressed that from like the censorship perspective and, and not going down that path. But, you know, what would, you know, in, in a couple of years, you know, down the regulatory pathway, 
you know, what does that really look like uh, for, for a consumer? So our, our core objective, and it has been from day one, is to be very focused and targeted with our objectives. Um, we're members of the community too. We're gaming citizens. We understand concerns, uh, like I mentioned, when it comes to uh, censorship. And we also don't want to destroy fair monetization practices for folks that are starting up a game company or uh, companies that are already out there. We don't want to shut off avenues of fair and honest monetization where you make a product you sell it to somebody for a fair price or, or just a direct transaction that you both agree on, regardless of what that price is, um, and then you move on with your day. We don't want to shut that off for people. So we're very focused on making sure uh, that any legislation that we've worked on and partner with a legislator um, in a state on is very focused on dealing very specifically with loot boxes and with any, you can define them as something else, but as a system that depends on a cash input, so a monetary cash input, not in-game experience, cash input, random chance, and prize. Outside of that, we think that there are a lot of other monetization schemes, subscriptions, uh, direct sales, uh, downloadable content that are direct and, and fair with their consumers, and we don't want to get into that. Um, but our real objective uh, in 2018 is to continue building our organization, get folks to contribute, even if it's just a dollar a month through our Patreon, to keep funding the campaign, so we can have staff like myself, we're traveling around the country, we're testifying, we're presenting to legislators, and we're talking and getting more folks on board uh, and educating and getting people activated to take real action on this issue state by state. We saw uh, Dr. Quirk, a legislator out in California with uh, Assembly Bill 2194, a fantastic piece of forward-thinking legislation. You alluded to it earlier. Um, it's going to... Uh, push forward on the mandatory labeling of products and games. The ESA saw that, and in collaboration, they came out and said that the industry would be following that practice already. So we see that as a big first win. Um, and if we can win uh, in these first small battles, as we're building our organization, we're getting gamers engaged, we're getting people who are concerned, even if they're not gamers, about uh, these kind of exploitative practices and these, this unregulated gambling space, uh, I think in the in the coming legislative sessions, we're going to see real progress and real success. Legislators are getting activated. They're understanding the issue. And it's really exciting for me every time that I'm either on a call or I'm meeting a legislator in person that when you discuss this with them, they get it. It doesn't matter their age. It doesn't matter uh, their political background, uh, right, left, red, blue. They get it. And that's really exciting. I think that now when you're talking about issues of addiction, when you're talking about issues of uh, kids and adults being um, feeling compelled into spending large quantities of money on these products uh, in a wholly unregulated way. People are getting really, to be honest, tired of uh, the way that certain bad actors have been behaving, and I don't think that those practices are going to be going on for much longer. So I'm very excited for the future, and I think we have a lot of great opportunities ahead of us. Wonderful. And so for gamers listening to this, how can they get involved? You know, there, there's a couple ways I'll just kind of share off the top. Uh, obviously, you know, you can check out uh, digitalfairness.org and find all the details for, you know, supporting their mission. And also just sharing your story, I, I think is so important. You know, the more people who share their story, the more, you know, there, there's opportunities for uh, that story to, to be able to expand and, and for people to really learn like how this is actually really impacting people. And, and so are there any other ways that people can get involved who care about this and, and really being able to help it move forward? Yeah, it's so first of all, as you said, sharing your stories are absolutely critical, especially to audiences that are um, working out of the English language. It's critical that we can communicate their stories to legislators and to civic leaders. Um, so please, if you are willing to share your story, it doesn't have to be with your full name and details. Um, it can be anonymous to whatever degree you're, you're willing to work with. Please contact us through our website. Uh, it is digitalfairness.org. Those really help us when we're talking to legislators about clear instances of harm with these products. Um, but we're also completely crowdfunded and run through Patreon. Uh, we're an all-volunteer organization, and we're also nonprofit. So this is not uh, a business venture in the traditional sense. This is very much an advocacy group that is focusing its resources on making real change. So if you could support us through Patreon, we are uh, Consumers for Digital Fairness on Patreon. And if you also want to check out uh, our latest news and information, it's all through our Twitter, at Digital Fairness on Twitter. And lastly, on, uh, through the Digital Fairness website, again, digitalfairness.org, 
Uh, we have uh, a blog that we've been working on for a little while, and we like to highlight um, what we call uh, the good guy highlights and other pieces in our Digital Frontier blog that talk about um, honest monetization practices, concerns within the industry, and also companies that we like to highlight or developers that we like to highlight and hold up as good examples of people who are creating quality content and also monetizing it and marketing it in responsible ways to their consumer base. Um, so those are all the ways to get engaged. And this is really a campaign that, again, regardless of your personal political stripe, uh, if you're concerned about these issues, we're happy to work with folks and be a rallying point to help them push forward, engage with their local legislator, uh, and also get feedback from the community as we build our platform and as we build uh, the mission and, and uh, the message that we're bringing forward to legislators. Wonderful. Thanks so much for the work that you're doing and your team is doing. And if anyone has any questions, just share them in the comments below and, and we'll get in there and, and we'll help answer them. And yeah, it's, it's exciting times in, in, in just the world of video game addiction itself. You know, World Health Organization officially recognizing it in May 2019, some of the legislative efforts, you know, and, and I just want everyone to know out there that, you know, obviously there's a lot happening and it's happening very quickly, but it's, uh, it's always coming back to like, how do we help people just live good lives and, and any way we can do that. That's what I'm about. So thanks so much, Chris. Great to chat. And uh, we'll talk soon. Cam, thanks so much. You've been fighting this fight for a really long time and have been a great thought leader and an inspiration for me and my team. Uh, so we're very happy to be a new part. Thanks so much for having me on. And also, uh, we're really proud to be able to stand with you and take this fight forward. You're no longer alone. We're pushing forward together. Thanks so much.